So our lesson today is about atomic structure and electron configuration and we're going to start delving into this inquiry question which is why are atoms of elements different from one another? So we're not going to completely finish that inquiry question today but it's definitely going to get us a move on into um, yeah, looking at the elements of that that's going to help us to answer that question. So our learning intention is that we will understand the basic structure of atoms and their electron configurations and hopefully by the end of this lesson you'll be able to describe um, atomic structure, relate atomic structure to ionization energy and also model electron configuration using SPDF notation. Okay so just to review atomic structure um, here we have um, like our, our normal atomic structure that you would have seen already and that is that we know that there's a nucleus in the middle of each atom and in that nucleus uh, is where the protons and neutrons are kept and those protons and neutrons um, there might be a different number of neutrons but the proton number comes from the atomic number on the periodic table so for lithium lithium has an atomic number of three its atomic mass is seven and therefore it actually has four neutrons in there now the reason an atom has to have neutrons in the nucleus is because if those protons were all together without something separating them then because like charges repel those protons would repel from each other and essentially the atom would cease to exist so the neutrons balance that out the only atom that doesn't have neutrons is hydrogen and that's because there's only one proton in the nucleus and therefore it, it doesn't need to be separated from anything now around the nucleus is what we call um, or what you will have learned as uh, shells okay and these electron shells are, are, are what keep the electrons and so you might have learned that the first shell can hold up to two electrons um, but at that point that shell is now full and so after that it has the electrons have to go into the second shell and the second shell can hold up to eight electrons and once that second shell has eight electrons it's now full and so any more electrons then pushes it into a third shell and so on um, so here we've got a lithium atom and the oxygen atom and you can see here that we've got oxygen's got two electrons in the first shell and it's got six uh, in the second shell so that second shell is still not full it could fit another two electrons um, and if it did have another two electrons then we would be looking at the element neon okay and that would obviously change the number of protons and neutrons as well so that's the basic atomic structure that you will have learnt so far um, and the important things to know here are the position of the, pro the protons and the neutrons and how to calculate how many there would be in any given atom. Um, the electrons and knowing how many electrons can fit into each shell. Um, now the next thing we're going to start looking at is uh, ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy needed to remove an electron from an atom. And what actually happens here is that in this, in this shell here, once this inner shell is complete, it actually creates a shield for any electrons in the second shell from the nucleus. So the thing that holds the atom together is the fact that we have a positive charge in the nucleus and these negatively charged electrons are drawn towards it because opposite charges um, attract. So once this shell here is filled, it creates a shield so this electron it's actually easier for this electron to be pulled away and so the ionization energy or the amount of energy needed to pull this electron away is actually much lower than say for example if we had helium um, and helium would only be two electrons in that first shell and two protons now the attraction um, between those two protons and two electrons would be so strong um, it would be really hard to pull one of these electrons away. But in lithium, because that shell is now full and we've got an extra one over here, it's, it's created the shield, so it's actually quite easy to pull this electron away. And that's what makes lithium and really any of our group 1 elements so reactive, is, is that the ease at which that electron can be given away. And so here we have a chart showing ionization energies of the first 20 elements. So at the bottom here, it's showing the nuclear charge. Essentially, that is the atomic number. Okay, and so here we have atomic number one, so that's hydrogen and helium. So hydrogen, we've got one proton and one electron. There's quite a decent um, bond between there, quite a decent attraction, I should say.
Here we have hydrogen. There's quite a decent attraction between the one electron and the one proton in the nucleus. Helium, though, because we've got two protons now, there's more of an attraction. And so it's going to take much more energy to pull an electron away. The other thing you might notice is that up here, at the top of each of these, are our noble gases. And remember, our noble gases, because it's got that complete outer shell, it is really difficult to break that. Okay, and so that's why it's got really high ionization energy. So to try and rip apart or take away one of those electrons is actually going to take a lot of energy. And here we can see lithium down here, which is the, the element we were just looking at. And you can see how low it is. It, it's so easy for that first electron or the valence electron um, to get taken away. And that's because of that shield that was created between the first shell and the second shell. All right, now, there are some issues with our our shell model or looking at electrons in shells. Firstly, the shells don't account for the uncertainty of where the electrons are situated at any given point in time. Okay, and so electrons don't um, sort of orbit around uh, at this, like what these diagrams seem to show that they do. It's not incorrect in that we can still use it and it helps us to understand the atomic model. Um, however, we can look at a quantum mechanical model that gives us just that little bit extra information that helps to refine the shell model. And so um, I, I refer to this as the orbital model. Um, if you are doing physics, you might have heard of it as the quantum mechanical model. And so we use this word orbital rather than orbit. And this word orbital refers to where electrons spend their time in a cloud of possibility. Now, in each of these clouds of possibility, there's a maximum of two electrons allowed in each orbital. And the reason for this is because, I mean, you know, so electrons have a negative charge. If we put two negatively charged things together, they're going to want to repel. But what actually happens here is each electron will spin in a different direction. So one electron will spin clockwise and the other electron will spin anticlockwise. And what that does, it actually creates a type of uh, magnetic um, spin. And then that means that one of them acts as a north pole, magnetic pole, and one of them acts as a south magnetic pole. And so there's a, a type of attraction there. And that's why we can actually have two electrons within the same sort of space or cloud in one of these orbitals. But it also explains why we can't have more than two. Okay? And so here we've sort of shown that here. So here we've got um, one orbital and for hydrogen, it's only got one electron and it's spinning in one particular direction and that's completely fine. But as soon as there's a second one, okay, we have helium and now in helium, we've got two electrons. And so one is spinning in one direction and the other is spinning in the other direction. And that's how we um, express that. Okay, so the first orbital that we have is called the S orbital. Um, I've put the names of like where the, the SPDF has come from. Um, this one was called Sharp, but the names are historical and now irrelevant. Um, I actually remember S orbital as the spherical orbital, and that's because that's the shape that it gives. So there'll be two or up to two electrons can fit in this orbital in this spherical shape. So the P orbital, um, these are dumbbell shaped and they happen along the X, Y, and Z axes. Uh, so we can have what we call the PX orbital. And so that's happening along the X axis. Uh, the PY orbital as shown in the second diagram, which is happening along the Y axis and the PZ orbital that is happening along, along the Z axis. And so um, you'll notice as well with these shapes, it's reminding us that we're working with 3D space and not 2D space. And that's another sort of limitation of um, the shell model is it the diagrams and, and things, they, they do sort of limit us to thinking in 2D space, even though we're actually talking about 3D space. Um, the other thing about these P orbitals is that they can hold two electrons in each, in each um, axis. Um, so that means that overall, if all of them are put together, like the diagram shown in the top right corner, it can hold up to six electrons. 
uh, the D orbital. Um, you can see these are shaped similar to the P orbital, um, but these are a double dumbbell. And they actually happen between the axes, so they're happening in a planar um, way. So you, if you look at the first one, we can see that those dumbbells are placed on the YZ plane. Um, and so as you look through those diagrams um, and those letters sort of help you to distinguish what planes um, the orbitals are actually using. Now the D orbital can hold up to 10 electrons. Um, and if you were to put all of those different diagrams together in the, you can see in the right um, top hand corner, it gets quite complex. Um, the F orbital, completely confusing um, and you don't really need to remember all of these different shapes or anything like that. So we're not going to go into that, um, except that it's good to know that the F orbital can hold up to 14 electrons. Okay, so let's just come back to our periodic table and have a look at um, how all of this fits together. So hopefully you remember from year 10 that we have the, the rows um, are called periods and they actually refer to the number of shells. So anything in row one or period one only needs one shell. In two we'll have two shells, three, three shells and so forth. Now we also have the groups and they go up and down and the groups are indicating the number of valent electrons. So that's how many electrons are in the outermost shell of that atom. Okay, and so in group one, down here, all of them have one electron in the outer shell. Here, all of group two have two electrons in the outer shell, and so on. Now, if we think about our S orbital, our S orbital can only fit up to two electrons. And so, and, and what's common about the S orbital is that that's the shape that the valent electrons have. So if we look at our periodic table, and we think about, okay, which groups... Um, which groups have one or two electrons in the outer shell? Well, that's going to be this section over here. So these elements here, these atoms, they have one or two electrons in the outer shell. And so we call that our S group. That's where our S orbital comes from. Okay. If we look at the P orbital, all right, that's over here. Um, and that is showing, well, anything from three to eight electrons in the outer shell. And that makes sense because the p orbital can fit up to six, okay? And if the first two or the, the last two are, are taken up by here, then that, that makes sense. Um, d orbital, okay, in the middle, and f, f groupings down the bottom, all right? And so, um, what, so what makes the, the groups is that in the s, the s blocks, all valent electrons are in the s orbital. Um, in the d block, all valent electrons are in the d block or in the d orbital. In the P block, all P or, or ugh, in the P. So in the S block, for these atoms, all valent electrons are in the S orbital. In the P block, all valent electrons are in the P orbital. In the D block, all valent electrons are in the D orbital. And for the F block, all valent electrons are in the F orbital. Uh, now, the only one that stands out over here is our helium, and that is because it, it actually belongs with the S block. That makes sense because it's got two electrons, S block, two electrons. All right, so we might, we're going to leave this video here, and the next video will go on to teaching you how to actually write the notation for the SPDF. Um, orbitals um, but what I encourage you to do is go back through this video and make sure that you understand the electron configuration and I'll just jump back to our learning intentions just jumping back to our just jumping back to our learning intentions and we're making sure that we understand. So our learning intention is that we will understand the basic structure of atoms and their electron configurations. We'll be able to describe atomic structure. That's, that's looking at the protons and the neutrons and the electrons in the shells and in the orbitals. Relate atomic structure to ionization energy. So that's thinking about the shielded um, electrons and thinking about valent electrons. The last one's model electron configuration using SPDF notation. Now that last one, uh, you should be able to have in your head what shapes are made from the different 
orbitals. Um, but in the next video, we'll actually look at how to write that out. Um, in the next video, we'll look at how to write that out. If you didn't, if you feel like you haven't met um, particularly success criteria one and two at this point, and you haven't met the learning intention, please watch the video again. Thank you.